Hello everybody, my name is Atty Grand. I'm going to talk to you today about the technical side of the Glasgow Digital Interface Explorer. I became aware of this project a few years ago and lurked on the sidelines for a while. However, midway through last year I got restless and decided to produce a small batch of RevC1 boards for myself and the community. I've been hooked since and I'm now quite involved in the project. You may have seen me talking about it on Twitter or streaming with it on Twitch. I'm joined today by Peter or Esden from 1Bit Squared, who will talk later. Glasgow was created by White Quark, who takes care of most of the maintenance and support responsibilities. If you find Glasgow or any of White Quark's other projects useful, please consider supporting her on Patreon. In the talk today, we'll cover the basic concept and what can I do aspect. We'll look at the front end and connectivity options between Glasgow and devices. We'll have a look at the interfaces between the software, that's Python on the PC, and the gateware, which is NMyGen on the FPGA. We'll look at the anatomy of an applet, focusing in on the UART. We'll take a deep dive into the byte stream data path, and we'll have a quick look at the future plans for the project, before I hand over to Peter, who will talk about the crowd supply campaign and the DFM work he's been coordinating. Finally, we'll answer any questions from the audience. If you've had a look at a board, you'll likely have seen Nono Hannah for Petit Cure on the back. Her quote can be read in English as, Glasgow can do anything, Glasgow can be anything. And this really emphasises the purpose of this project. One of the major benefits is that we can deal with non-standard, hard real-time signalling. Signals are generated and handled in the FPGA, which means there's no need to worry about software or interrupts interfering with your waveform. There's no need to misuse peripherals like SPI or I2S either. For example, you can connect to a string of RGB LEDs like WS2812, and you can keep a Hub75 panel refreshed. We've currently got a 3-bit output with a 64x64 64 64 pixel frame buffer, though this is work in pro progress and there are improvements to come. You can connect a speaker directly to Glasgow, push audio samples over USB, and the gateware implements a Sigma Delta DAC, which effectively produces a pulse density modulation output. This sounds surprisingly good with zero extra components. JTAG, SPI, and I2C interfaces are all supported, and you can even produce a VGA test pattern. You can capture single frames from parallel RGB interfaces, and you can detect unknown JTAG pinouts. You can even interface with a UART with an unknown voltage and unknown board rate. I really encourage you to take a look at the long list of applets in the GitHub repo. We can probably connect with many unknown or proprietary interfaces. Just connect it up and write an applet. Analog or interfaces that require a PHY are more difficult, but they're not necessarily impossible. For example, I'm currently working on a CAN add-on module. Considerable effort and design work has gone in to ensure that this is a simple install and setup procedure, followed by a robust and reliable and trustworthy tool. All you do is run a few commands, plug it in and go. Linux is supported very well out of the box and Windows support exists and is maturing. I believe White Cork has even had this running on an Android phone, though that's not a supported platform. There's no need to know or learn any Python or NMyGen, it's useful as it stands. However, if you want to dive in, go for it. Tweak or change the existing applets or write your own. There's a great and growing community for support and discussion. You can easily connect to many digital interfaces, and the applet library is large and growing. We have a planned structure for contributions from the community. We expect good and tested applets to be in tree, with OK untested community contributions in a separate repository. We will also have the ability to handle private applets in your own private trees as well. Glasgow uses the open source FPGA toolchain, which is very quick. You'll rarely find yourself waiting a significant time for the gateway to build. To give you a getting started example, you can connect an SCD30, which is a CO2 temperature and humidity sensor with only four wires to Glasgow. You can run the applet and immediately get sensor readings. If you tweak the command line slightly, you can record those sensor readings into InfluxDB. If you connect that to Grafana, you can then find yourself going from zero to graphs in less than five minutes. InfluxDB and other logging options are built into Glasgow and they come for free. There are 16 I.O. pins which are arranged into two ports, each of eight pins. You can power an interface with many things without any additional circuitry. It's designed for carefree hookup, meaning that accidents are okay. Glasgow effectively converts a hardware problem into a software problem. Don't have to worry about shorts, and you don't worry about blowing up the hardware. 
A major amount of effort has gone into making it reliable, and you should never find yourself wondering, do I trust Glasgow right now? We've all been there with other tools, and it's not a great place to be. Every pin has a bi-directional buffer and level shifter, and can handle signals up to about 100 MHz, at 1.8 volts. The frequency depends on the translation voltage. Each pin has a 10K pull-up, pull-down or no-pull resistor, which is connected to a tri-state buffer. Every single pin has ESD protection and can tolerate an infinite short circuit. This front end permits clever things like open drain with no external components. The onboard 10K resistors permit generic termination, but these can be easily modified with an axial resistor using the wires provided to place it in parallel. For example, to increase the pull-up strength, you can add a 3.1K resistor in parallel with the onboard 10K to get approximately 2.4 kilo ohm of pull-up which is ideal for a strong I2C pull-up. Each port then as a group has the ability to supply a 1.8 to 5 volt power at up to 150 milliamps, which again supports infinite short circuit. All of the IOs are translated to the port's voltage. We can measure voltages up to 36 volts and with this monitor you can then power off the port if the device under test turns off or drops out of tolerance. This can protect the device under test and avoids back powering. There's also a voltage mirror mode which allows you to take a reading at startup and mirror that to the output. There's current sense and overcurrent protection as well, again to protect the device under test. There are two interfaces available between the Python and the gateway. The first is the byte stream. From the developer's point of view, this looks like a socket in Python and a FIFO in NMyGen. Low performance is easy to use and ready to go. However, high performance is fiddly and needs careful handling. We'll cover that more later. Future Glasgow revisions are expected to support Ethernet. The protocol should, should adapt easily. The second interface is registers, and these provide configuration and feedback within the applet's components. They behave just like peripheral configuration registers in a micro. Only one side can write, and this is a build time decision. For example, the UART uses it to configure the bit time, or the board rate, where the PC writes to the register, and it also uses it to retrieve the receive error count back, where the FPGA writes to the register. Looking at the anatomy of an applet, there are largely three phases. The build phase constructs and builds the gateware. The run phase connects the gateware in the FPGA to the Python, and the interact phase presents the applet to the outside world. Not all applets have an interact phase, for example the VGA is just a test pattern generator, so it produces that test pattern on the output and then the application quits, leaving the test pattern going. Some things will require a rebuild. Any changes to the build time command line arguments or the gateway sources will cause a rebuild. The build time command line arguments can significantly affect the generated gateway. Any run, run or interact phase command line arguments do not cause a rebuild. For example, if you're using a board rate of greater than 9600 with a UART, then there's no rebuild required even if you change that board rate. Focusing in on an example applet, the UART has some really neat features. With auto board detection, the receive side locks onto the shortest bit time it sees, it reports this to the user, and the transmit side follows that board rate as well. It also provides one of three interfaces, for example TTY, which is using this terminal standard in and standard out, PTY, which allows other applications like PicoCom or Minicom to make use of this UART, as well as Socket, which acts like a terminal server, allowing applications like Netcat or other simple Socket clients to use this UART as well. The gateware constructed during the build phase covers everything on the right hand side. The FPGA and Python are linked together during the run phase, and the interface is exposed to the wider world during the interact phase. That's one of the three components on the left, depending on the command line arguments. The gateware sources are in the applet file, and potentially in other imported modules as well. Common blocks are abstracted away, for example the UART. Changes to sources may trigger a rebuild of the gateware. Even so, as mentioned, the build times are measured in seconds. Python code can be changed without any rebuild. For example, if you're working on a socket, then you can do that with no problems. Registers can be changed without a rebuild as well, and they are accessible from Python at runtime. For example, a change in board rate will not require a rebuild. Build arguments can significantly alter the gateware. 
If you don't want transmit capabilities, then don't build them. Remove those transmit components. Alternatively, if you want to use a board rate below 9600 board, then it's simple to rebuild with a wider counter that can facilitate those longer bit times. Taking a deep dive now into the byte stream. The simple and low bandwidth applications don't need to care and they can use the FIFOs in ignorance. This is ideal for things like I2C. High bandwidth or streaming applications, however, need to take care on the buffer management. Lots of the issues are just taken care of for you, however I believe there's one major ed edge case which is still present as a hidden trap for users. It's not obvious, it has a technic deep technical explanation, but hopefully the cause and the details below will become more apparent soon. Glasgow can do about 42 megabytes per second with careful handling, but with the, without this care, a 150k bytes per second might be too much and cause buffers to overflow. We're going to expand on those magic blocks shown below. Even this diagram is simplified. All of the kernel activities and buffering are omitted as out of control and out of scope. Python is reasonably well behaved using one async IO task for each of transmit, receive, FIFO, and it's on a PC so it has plenty of memory. The USB link and the FX2 FPGA crossbar are more complex and we'll cover this now. First up's the USB link. As you probably know, USB is entirely under the host's control. Devices may only speak if spoken to, meaning that if a device has lots to say, then sending a partial packet is effectively saying, I'm done. You won't get attention again for a while and you lose out on the bandwidth. If you have lots to say, then aim to fill every packet you can. In this case, that's 512 bytes. Providing a full packet effectively says, I have more to say, and this way the host will probably come back to you again and ask you if you have more data. With the defaults, you'll send small packets, which is a problem and a waste of bandwidth. Next up is the FX2 to FPGA crossbar. This is a massively complex area, but the user doesn't have to know anything about it. It just works thanks to White Quark. Have a peek in FX2 crossbar.py for three screens of explanation from White Quark. The FX2 has four FIFOs built into it, and the FPGA has up to four FIFOs to mirror these depending on the applet you're running. The crossbar coordinates transfers between these two FIFOs, but it can only operate in a point-to-point -point basis. The FX2 is configured for synchronous transfer, giving us better throughput, and to accept a clock from the FPGA. There is also a 2-bit address to choose from the FX2's internal FIFO. The FPGA is entirely in control of this link. You can't use combinational logic on a bus, which means that I.O. must be buffered using a register on a global clock. This adds pipelining, which means that data is in flight or being passed along a chain. The pipelining complicates feedback and adds a delay, which means that the FPGA writes to an FX FIFO, the full flag will appear to be asserted a number of cycles late due to that pipeline. In addition to this, the FX2 signals aren't valid until long after the FPGA's input capture window has passed, which necessitates further careful handling. It is possible to do things like configure the FX2 to assert a full flag one cycle early, but these things start to create a feedback nightmare, where you're possibly unsure if the FX2 FIFO is actually full or if it's already overflowed. White Quark has come up with a different solution for each of the in versus out FIFOs, both of which are very elegant. The in FIFO solution adds a counter to the in FIFO in the FPGA, keeping track of the FX2 FIFO's level. If the FX2 FIFO on the left has 5 bytes in it, then this counter has the value 5. This gives us a virtual but perfect full flag, meaning that the pipelining and delays can be handled nicely. This does, however, require out-of-band coordination for reset and FIFO purge. This is handled anyway for resetting the applet. The out FIFO solution adds a very small FIFO before the main FIFO in the FPGA. This FIFO is large enough to absorb any additional data that might be in flight in the pipeline, even if the main FIFO is already full. In addition to the pipelining, we need to handle packetization. USB is packet-oriented, but the FIFOs are byte-oriented. It doesn't make much sense to attempt to present a packet-oriented interface to Gateware. However, we do still need to handle USB's packet-based nature. If we want to send short USB packet, we need to forcibly flush the FX2 FIFO using the packet end signal. If we send a full USB packet but have nothing further to say, we also need to forcibly generate a zero length packet as well. 
Without this, the application can appear to hang because the OS is expecting more data and is attempting to fill the queued buffer. Ultimately, the real focus for the user should be on the transmit end of each interface. All of the considerations are abstracted to this level. In summary, timing for the flashing is really important. For low bandwidth applications, auto flush equals true, which is the default, allows you to use it with no care and it works just fine. For high throughput applets, auto flush needs to be set to false. This allows you to make the best use of the available bandwidth, but now you need to flush the FIFOs yourself. For example, a UART at 1.5 meg board can overflow its FIFOs during a burst of incoming data, even though that's only a maximum of 150k bytes per second. A simple fix is to increase the buffer size, which works to a point, but a better fix might be to flush the FIFOs when there's a good amount of data, ready to fill a USB packet. With careful configuration, Glasgow can achieve 42 megabytes per second over USB, which is approximately 70% bus utilization. Looking at the future plans, there has been some confusion regarding the revision term used here. For clarity, these are effectively different product lines under the Glasgow project umbrella. Price, performance and capabilities all rise for each line. The expectation is that the Glasgow Rev-C will always be supported. It's what we have today, it does not compete with the other future revisions, it is a different tool. Revision D will increase the I.O. count to 32 pins by adding two additional ports. It will also maintain compatibility with existing Rev-C add-ons. There's a mini spec on GitHub if you're interested, but no work has really been done on this yet, and it's planned, but likely more than two years out. Revision E then probably makes use of USB 3 and or Ethernet. It will likely deal with faster, low voltage and differential interfaces, and will probably make use of Syzygy connectors. It may even support things like MIPI. This is not at all suitable for what the Rev-C is used for. There's no spec on this and no work has been done yet. It's far out on the horizon. At this point, I'll hand over to Peter. Thank you, Adi. Hello, everyone. My name is Piotr Zdentemski. I am the founder of OneBit Squared. We are a company specializing in design, production, and distribution of open source hardware for educators, students, hobbyists, and professionals. We make development boards as well as tools. All of our products are designed in tight collaboration with the open source projects themselves. Here are a few things that we make. Uh, it's a Blackmagic Probe, JTEC, and SWD debugger with a built-in GDB server, so you don't need an in-the-middle tool like uh, OpenOCD, uh, which makes it uh, easier to use, where it auto-detects the targets. We also make the Icebreaker FPGA, which is an ICE40 up 5K based uh, development board uh, designed for the use in education, as well as a good prototyping board for your projects. And it is meant to work with the open source FPGA flow, which is called uh, Yosis HQ. So you should check it out if you don't know about this yet. Uh, we also make the Bitmagic Logic Analyzer, which is meant to work with uh, Seagrock and PulseView, which is an open source framework for logic analyzers and uh, supports a lot of hardware, but our hardware is specifically designed to work with uh, that particular open source project. We also make the Glasgow, which uh, we will be talking about today. I got involved in, uh, in Glasgow on White Quark's request. Um, I was uh, tasked with uh, doing the batch production uh, so that we can take uh, care of lower costs of the hardware through economies of scale. We can. Uh, uh, I was also uh, asked to help with the design for manufacture so that to make uh, the yield in production better as well as taking care of all the logistics of making like sourcing the parts making the boards uh, manufacturing them either with uh, our in-house capabilities or as through SEM and then distributing it through one bit squared stores and uh, other uh, vendors like uh, Mauser for example so this the goal of that is to make the hardware easier to access to the people that want to use the software and the hardware and uh, that you don't have to build the hardware yourself. So as a result, we made the crowd supply campaign and the campaign, um, the link is uh, below there. You should go there and check it out. Um, 
At the moment when you're watching this uh, talk, uh, the campaign is over, but uh, don't fret. Uh, the hardware is still available for pre-order right after the campaign is over, and you will get the hardware as soon as the pledges for the backers are fulfilled. Uh, the pre-orders will be going out pretty quickly after that because we will be making it in um, um, batches and uh, getting it out uh, quite quickly. So design for manufacture, the hardware was uh, designed, as you know, there are several um, models of the hardware and um, uh, Revision A was made by uh, Whitequark herself and then Rev B with uh, Awigeo and Rev C was uh, done uh, by Markan and input from the community. I was involved in some of the DFM and built prototypes of Rev C1 in uh, late 2019. And uh, um, through that process of building the prototypes, we found some um, manufacturing issues that we could improve. Uh, and uh, this is the result. This is the Ref C2. If you think, of, if you look at it, it's like the difference is not very visible. Um, but uh, this was over 79 uh, commits in GitHub to get from the previous version to this. It's like uh, the most visible changes are like the USB connector being a USB-C connector instead of a micro USB as well as addition of um, uh, current measurement uh, that we will be talk, uh, uh, talking in a minute about. Uh, I would like to focus on a few details uh, of the changes that we made and explain wh what the, the thought behind that was and why we did it. One thing that uh, is a very common improvement for manufacturing is changing the pads from being um, just rectangular corners to round rect corners. This is uh, actually by now a recommendation from JDEC themselves, which is an organization that gives uh, uh, electronics manufacturing recommendations uh, for footprints and many other things. So uh, uh, the reason for that is uh, that uh, uh, lead-free solder doesn't flow as well as uh, leaded solder. So um, this improves filleting around the parts and around the legs. So it is a very easy change to improve this. And uh, unfortunately, the KiCad library still, some of the parts are not updated uh, to round rect, even though it is in the process. So um, this was an easy change to fix. We also realized that the um, diode packs, the ESD diode packs had these ground pads and they were causing us trouble in manufacturing where they were uh, connecting between the pads and causing just shorts to ground. So that was not good. We could have removed just the pads, but uh, we also looked at the av availability of these packs and it turned out there are others that are uh, overall not uh, more expensive than this part and they are easier to get. They are much more common and putting two of them next to each other was not a problem. So we did this change. Similar thing with the um, inline uh, uh, resistors or the um, termination resistors. The eight-way uh, um, packages are not as common as four-way packages, so we changed that and made uh, overall it actually worked out very well. It is uh, even not doesn't take up as much space on the PCB as the uh, eight-way pack. Another thing that we found through the prototypes was that the packages that we were using, which were the SOT666 parts, they uh, sometimes were causing um, uh, shorts between the legs. So we went to a, a slightly bigger package with bigger spacing between the pins. And as a side effect, this is actually a more common part and cheaper to get. So the level shifters are also improved. So we were trying to kill a few birds at the same time. Uh, with our changes. Um, another thing that uh, I did while I was at it, uh, I changed the sock screen on uh, the board. And uh, this is something that I learned from uh, showing off the hardware at um, different events. It is nice to have a legend of which functionality sections there are on the PCB. The labels of uh, the IDs of the parts are useful if you are uh, developing on the board and you are just uh, doing a lot of soldering and rework on the board. It is not very useful even in assembly. You can use something like uh, interactive HTML bomb, which is an amazing tool and plugin for KiCad, which I really recommend. 
and uh, uh, or KiCad itself to find the parts and geographically find them on the board. It is very easy to use to assemble if you have a monitor next to your uh, prototype assembly desk. So these, this information, in my opinion, is not as useful as having a legend on the board itself. We also added, uh, we, uh, we allowed ourselves a little bit feature creep too. So uh, one thing we added is a reset button. Uh, this reset button is uh, tied into an improved um, um, uh, power cycling um, circuitry, which allows us to uh, switch on the power rails in the right order and reset the parts that are necessary. For example, the, um, there are several parts that are on the I2C bus and they don't have dedicated reset pins. So if you want to hard reset them, you have to basically power them off and power them on again. So this is this improvements allowed us to do certain things like that and be able to also tie in the reset button. Another uh, semi-feature creep thing, but it was a huge improvement in the, uh, for the tool itself and for its reliability was the change of the ADC to uh, a power monitoring part. It uh, also monitors the current that goes to the power banks and it has settable software settable thresholds, which can trigger an interrupt and tell the rest of the design that something is off and the voltage is out of spec or the current draw on the um, on the um, banks for the GPIO is too high and that allows us to um, to make the hardware more robust. Same thing with over and under voltage protection. We have diodes now that can take care of that. They, we sacrifice some of the diodes to even make sure that when you really go out of spec that they fail in, an, in a deep designed way so they you just have to resolder the diode instead of replacing more severe parts on the board which is nice so the whole project uh, was a huge uh, group effort so thank you very much for white quark for starting it all the contributions for uh, into the hardware by Awigeo markan electronic eel he contributed a lot of the uh, feature creep features <laughs> which are really really useful and made the hardware so much better uh, through that process and uh, many more people in the Glasgow IRC channel or on our discord um, on one bit squared discord so uh, I always like to comment a little bit about KiCad when I have a chance uh, this project also highlighted a few things that I would love to see in KiCad in the future so uh, KiCad rocks I love it I use it for all um, uh, our projects and I would uh, I think it is a very capable tool I still would like to see a diff tool that can take care of um, collaboration and uh, allowing to see what the differences are between boards uh, the current solutions with Gerber files diffing is are not very good or the websites that are available are not performant they are very slow to use so um, a dedicated tool would be amazing if someone put that together same thing with a web visualizer for the designs like being able to see the schematic or the pcb layout on uh, on github directly would be really amazing um, a more streamlined uh, contribution of packages uh, would be great uh, that's something i would love to see as well as svg visualization thank you peter i hope this talk has been informative and useful if you'd like to have a chat with us, you can find us in the Glasgow channel, which is available either on IRC on freenode.net or in the one bit Square Discord server. You can have a look at the sources on GitHub, and you can even get your own. The crowd supply campaign has ended now, but it should be available for pre-order. Again, if you find Glasgow or any of White Quark's other projects useful, please consider supporting her on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and we'll take any questions now. Development and that's recently come to my attention. They've registered a trademark and things as well. Um, so if you're if you're looking for the latest development or support, um, please just be aware to go to uh, GitHub.com/nmygen/nmygen. Uh, you can find the nmygen channel on freenode.net or on the OneBit Square Discord server. And like I've said before a couple of times, please consider supporting White Cork. So thank you. Oh. Abs absolutely. I think that that right there, um, we don't do enough of this sort of uh, out outreach in in the uh, FOSS community where we say the uh, developers actually 
have uh, need, need to be exchanging this this time for things that they can use to buy groceries and pay rent. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this is how the uh, free and open hardware and software turns into these projects that people can really enjoy, use, benefit from as as a larger community. So we'll we'll, we'll definitely look forward to uh, look forward to that. On this project, this has been a real, I, I would say, labor of love um, because surely because this has been has been uh, in in the works for quite some time now. Can can you guys say a little bit about uh, about where how far this has come from its from its initial kind of uh, idea that uh, uh, White Cork throughout there to the community. Yeah, well, uh, I certainly came aware of this possibly even two years ago and, you know, wanted one immediately. Uh, Peter might be better suited to talk about the uh, the history of, you know, how it's come to be a, a real product in inverted commas now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been a long time coming and it's been a lot of effort on everyone's part. So well done. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, so uh, maybe a little bit to the um, time frame of the whole thing. Um, I'm maybe not 100% uh, uh, accurate about the timing, but uh, it's about uh, two, two and a half years now that this project was under development. I got, I'm also not the first person in the project. It's like the initiator of all this is uh, White Quark and she deserves all the praise for starting it and coordinating it and being the maintainer of all this. It's like she does an amazing job here. Uh, and essentially it, uh, it managed to, the project itself like triggered a certain need in the community and was made possible by the uh, FPGA uh, tools becoming, the open source FPGA tools becoming a thing. Um, without them, Glasgow would n not be possible. It would be a very different tool if uh, if that was not there. Because having the FPGA synthesis as part of the of the complete software stack is what makes Glasgow so different from anything that came before. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's uh, it was a continuing development, and it essentially over the several years, it was not just the hardware that went through now three major revisions, but uh, we had uh, Rev A, Rev B that are now basically just historical footnotes as you saw in the presentation. But um, yeah, the last year we had a version that Ati, uh, I think, built uh, with his like small batch for himself uh, in uh, tw late 2019, I built uh, prototypes. Yeah, it's the middle of last year. I think I did a batch run of about 50 mm -hmm. boards, primarily for people in Europe yeah uh, and that went really well i was you know i was looking to build some because i wanted one and i thought maybe a few other people will want some as well but i had so much interest it was really fantastic and uh that's been seconded now by the crowd supply campaign that, that peter's doing as well so uh, <laughs> yeah it's fantastic yeah and going from there it's like we found some additional uh issues that we had to like adjust and improve and that's that's why it took so long because there's so many moving parts this isn't a complicated project it's it wouldn't be possible without the huge amount of people that were are involved in this project uh, on hardware as well as the software side of things the the yak stack as we call it it's like nmegen and uh, the open source fpga tools that are on the software side of things as well as like upgrades to uh async io and stuff like that um they they all like contribute to make this uh, this thing what it is and yeah i it took a while we are there we are i'm very excited to build this and get the hardware to as many people as possible so um a few questions from the uh from the audience here uh how well does the synchronization work so if you wanted to run a feedback loop through Glasgow right now, uh, how how much do you worry about the predictability of the of the latency, the jitter in the I/O pipeline? So there's been some discussion of this on the on the chat, uh, which is fantastic. Thank you everybody for joining in. And uh, as you might expect, because of what the FPGA is and everything, the FPGA can deal with the real time signaling and and everything correctly at that level. But because you then have USB, you've then got an operating system, a kernel, and you've then got Python involved in the loop as well. Um, 
the hard real time, you know, the really tight timing constraints, you probably won't hit, unfortunately, if you have to involve the host as well. So as much as possible, if you're dealing with, with real time stuff needs to be put down on the Glasgow itself, on, on the board and the FPGA. Um, but, you know, if you're actually talking about half a second being being tight enough, then you'll probably get away with doing it through Python. Very nice. The uh, do, you, do you have um, future plans for uh, hardware revisions that um, will expand on the current uh, capabilities or the current maybe reduce your current limitations, whatever those uh, whatever those are at the moment? I got it. Peter, take that on. <laughs> So uh, there was, the, this is referring probably a little bit also to the question about the RAM. Uh, so uh, we are also working on an add-on for the current version, which is called the RAM pack, uh, and it will add additional memory to the FPGA as is. So applets that need more memory, like a frame buffer or something, this will happen. Uh, regarding the future revisions, like the time frame is completely unknown, but we, there is, there are plans to essentially you can think as as Ati described in the presentation itself it's like you have, you have revision c which is more of a model number c d and e will be model numbers they will be parallel hardware versions that have more different capabilities uh compared to the current version but they will not replace it um but when they will be, become a thing is a very good question because uh, it will be another development project of basically another generation of the hardware. And so that can take another year <laughs> until we see those, but it is planned for sure. And uh, we have also some path down that road. So like Rev D will have more IO and Rev E will have a, a faster F and bigger FPGA, for example. So. Yeah, if you're interested into the details, just join the, the chat and you, we are happy to like give you the rundown of uh, what the plans are. But for now, it's uh, Rev C is what we are building and mm -hmm. we are also thinking of add-ons for it. Just to expand on the add-ons, um, just mentioned I'm, I'm building a CAN interface, which I mentioned uh, in the slide deck. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, if you if you want to interface with things which require something that isn't TTL or isn't, you know, 1.8 volt logic or whatever, then that's by no means impossible. Um, you can you can put a fire on a separate board and, and off you go kind of thing. Very nice. That's um, with these larger projects, uh, quite frequently you'll have a, a section of it that grows into its own sort of uh, sub project on its, uh, on its own, maybe even branching out into uh, into a library that becomes useful for um, for spin-offs or 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 projects that are related or or maybe even not do do you see some aspects of uh, of the Glasgow work now being useful in a larger lar larger community outside of the uh, board project itself uh, that's a, a pretty interesting question um, I, I have a feeling that White Quark tried to implement some LPC interfacing uh, for Glasgow and ran into some problems. And that's sort of the, one of the main reasons that NMyGen came about is that um, MyGen, the, the older version, wasn't quite suitable. And actually, you know, if, if you tweak some of the interfaces and, and do some things, then LPC might be a possibility. Um, so in, in some sense, that is a fantastic sort of example of, of how this, this contributes back, if that makes sense, yeah. Nice. Uh, that's 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 one wonderful. I'm I'm I personally am, am really thrilled to see this sort of uh, of of community project come out of these various uh, open source tool chains. So you are kind of bringing a number of these together. Are there any aspects of uh, of Glasgow of, uh, that still are not feasible with an open tool chain? Are you looking at uh, parts of it that still rely on a, on, on a closed bit of software or closed, uh, a closed bit set that, that maybe could still be up, updated? As, as far as I'm aware, uh, you've got the, the board itself designed in KiCad, which is completely open. 
You've got the gateway, which is then written in NYGen, which which uses uh, Yosis, Nextpoint, PNR, and that kind of thing. The open flow toolchain, uh, so that's just completely open as well. You've got Python, which is again open source. Yeah, <laughs> I think possibly the most closed part of this is the FX2 and possibly USB, but they're they're well understood that that is is kind of not not, not a problem really. Oh yeah, and Rachel is making a very good point about uh, the JTAG interposers and uh, USB. So like she also lists a bunch of add-ons that she made. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, yeah, it's it, as I said, it's a huge community project, and uh, like we, it is paradigm in this group of people that uh, if only po well essentially we will not implement a thing if we can't do it with open source tools <laughs> i would go so far of leaning my myself out of the window it's like we would <laughs> not have built glasgow if we had to rely on some closed source thing uh, except yes silicon this is another frontier that is hopefully mm. with uh, the open uh, like with uh, the open ASIC uh, flow and like uh, the open PDK that is on the horizon. Well, maybe at some point the chips on Glasgow are also open source and made with uh, open source synthesis tools uh, for ASICs. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's now <laughs> it is actually possible. It, it's 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 looking <laughs> it's looking like it might not be that uh, that crazy, huh? Yeah. Well, we have we have time for one last question. Um, can what what's the feasibility of say multi-loading separate applets onto the Glasgow at the same time? So to run a multi-interface integration test, is this something that you've planned for or could see uh, feas feasibly implemented? Yeah, so this is this is something that doesn't currently exist. It would need some work to make it happen, um, but it's certainly sort of one of the considerations that Workwalks put into this project. Um, so I, I suspect some of the software might be sort of ready to to support it, although, you know, not end-to-end -end yet. Um, so, for example, if you wanted multiple UARTs, today I would probably tell you to hack one applet to do multiple interface or multiple channels. But but in the not-too-distant future, I, I think that, that might be something that, that's coming along, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, guys, I, I really appreciate uh, your coming on to talk about this uh, about this project and um, I hope that uh, we have uh, we have represented white corks work um, in in a good light um, I, I know that uh, she's put a tremendous amount of of time sweat and energy in into this and we wouldn't be here without her uh, without her genesis and and, the, and her continued contribution here so uh, I put a link to this chat in the main chat and people should jump over here and kind of continue with the Q&A. You guys uh, hang out here on the live stream and you should be, um, people I know have some, uh, lots of additional questions uh, for you guys. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you and um, I hope hope that we can do it, uh, do it again soon, maybe in person next time. Maybe. Thank you for having us. <laughs> okay, take care guys. Everybody.